Okay, um, so what we're going to talk about today is tax efficient giving. Um, so that is making it so that you can pay the least amount of taxes as possible when you give and thus uh, increase the total amount that you give. And we're talking about other strategies as, as well. Um, this will talk about um, uh, different types of tax strategies, but it also talk about how those apply with cryptocurrency. And I'll also try to assume that you don't uh, know anything. Um, and there's a general outline of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so you are here uh, right at the beginning. Uh, just um, go over and uh, um, talk about what we're going to be covering. Um, so where to give general examples in general about tax efficiency, um, some specific application to cryptocurrency, and then some uh, opportunity for questions. Um, and with sections parts three and four, on those we'll have some case examples where, because some of the stuff is a little bit complicated, I'll give you a fact pattern and we'll kind of talk our way through it. Uh, so uh, a bit about me, I've been, uh, engaged in effective altruism since 2017. I'm a licensed attorney, um, did a bunch of other school stuff, uh, done some continuing education, looking at um, technical aspects of, of giving, uh, uh, although that doesn't count the enormous amount of uh, books I've read on uh, different uh, aspects of, of taxes and philanthropy. Um, I give uh, personally and I give publicly on my, and you can see that on my personal website, which is just aaronhamlin.com. It's got a bunch of resources on there. Um, one of the things I do when I do give publicly is I also explain exactly how I give, not just where I give to and the rationale for why I do it. Um, I do own cryptocurrency myself. Uh, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrency. Um, and uh, I've written a number of essays on uh, technical aspects of giving. Uh, so why uh, why give this talk? Uh, because I've found myself being uh, really bothered by two things. Uh, one is when charities don't get uh, the amount of funds that they should because of uh, tax errors. And then secondly, uh, when I have heard of uh, folks paying enormous tax bills that were completely avoidable. Um, and so I just don't want those things to happen to you. So that's that's why I'm here giving this talk for you. A um, little disclaimer, um, so I will not be giving any investment advice, um, and I will not be helping any of you with your personal taxes. Uh, I am not your uh, personal lawyer. Uh, I'm just doing this for informational purposes. Um, this, I find, is a really great guide, in particular, when you're talking with your uh, tax advisor or financial planner. Um, some of them, unfortunately, aren't as sophisticated uh, dealing with uh, philanthropy. Uh, and so this can also provide a good guide for when you're talking with your personal um, personal advisor. And uh, I do spend a lot of time on this uh, uh, through my uh, daily work. Um, and I spend an enormous amount of time putting these essays together in a way that is understandable. Uh, but the tax code is also complicated. So it is possible that I uh, have an error in there that I don't know. Um, but I do everything I can to uh, to avoid that. And I will work to be transparent with you on areas where um, I'm uh, less confident or I have a knowledge gap or the law itself is unclear, which is also the case sometimes. Uh, so part two, where to give. And this is an area where a lot of EAs are on this call. Uh, these are not uh, foreign ideas for, uh, for you, but for, for other folks, uh, what will matter more than how you give and how much you give is where you give. Uh, that by far has the largest impact. So it's important that you uh, think about it. Uh, so uh, you can uh, look up effective altruism to learn more about um, different aspects of giving. Uh, but here are four um, uh, key components that you want to think about. One is the impact. Uh, that is, is actually do something meaningfully important, the, the charity that you're giving to. Um, is the charity neglected? Uh, so the, the idea of uh, does uh, you adding uh, more of your um, uh, money to that charity, uh, uh, does that have a, a good um, kind of uh, uh, 
is it reaching the point of diminishing returns? Can, can they can they use more funds uh, if they if they can't? Or uh, there are a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of attention there already, and you have diminishing returns, then it makes it less appealing. Um, tractability, like can it actually work? Um, like is what they're doing feasible um, within that charity? And then the scale um, that is uh, can it affect a large number of individuals, whether people, animals, whatever cause area, um, like whatever individual um, uh, is for the charity that, that you're looking at. And uh, of course, a shameless plug, um, I'm the executive director for the Center for Action Science, wonderful charity on reforming democracy at the very fundamental level, affects policies, um, making sure that we don't have a terrible government to um, do uh, terrible things. So uh, we want to uh, maximize the world around us. It's a very efficient way of doing that by making sure we have a competent government and targeting the voting method. So now the fun stuff. We get to talk about all about the technical aspects of giving, and we're going to go through some examples. One of the most effective ways of, of giving, and this is a nice one because it interfaces with a lot of other um, uh, techniques that we're going to talk about, and that is with employer matching. Um, and also, there's other types of matching too. So for instance, at every.org earlier this year, they had matching up to $100 uh, per charity. Uh, those, are, those opportunities are pretty uh, rare. Um, and so uh, even if you can't do it in the most tax efficient ways, otherwise, a uh, one-to-one -one match is uh, really awesome. And so you should generally be taking advantage of that whenever you can and working to, to uh, max that out. Um, you can go to double your uh, donation. That's one way to look at it, um, to see if your employer um, has uh, matching. There's a bunch of resources, resources that uh, match for more, uh, which uh, uh, Dan Hageman and, and, and I uh, uh, work on. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and some of the other nice uh, 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 components are that um, you don't like in some of these, like you need to itemize in order to be able to take advantage of the tax benefit here. You don't even have to itemize on your taxes. It works uh, for uh, anyone who has the opportunity to do employer matching. Um, so here we're we'll getting into a bit more detail. So what we're going to be talking a lot is a particular um, uh, type of asset uh, that, that you're going to be uh, giving. And um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, what are called long-term appreciated assets. Um, these are assets that you've held longer than a year. And these are assets that have gained in value since you originally purchased them. Typically, we're going to be talking about stock, um, and uh, we're talking about stock because it's uh, uh, um, one of the uh, um, uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's a simpler type of of asset, and it's relative to other types of assets. It's pretty liquid, um, and so that's where we're going to be focusing a lot of our attention on on stock versus other more complicated assets like real property and things like that. So we're going to be focusing more on this. Um, so uh, what you want to do, uh, what you want to keep in mind when thinking about a long-term appreciated asset uh, like stock is you want to make sure that the stock itself goes directly to the charity or uh, what we're going to be going into later, which is a donor advice fund. If you sell the stock and then you give the cash from the sale, uh, you have lost an enormous amount of the tax benefits. You, um, you realize the gains of the stock. That is, um, that, that counts, like when you sell the stock, uh, those gains from the purchase price from what you got it at to the uh, price that you sold it at, that difference uh, now goes on your taxes as taxable income when you sell it. You do not want this to happen. Uh, if you're thinking about giving stock or using the assets uh, uh, from the stock, uh, you want to give that directly. Do not sell the stock and then gift 
the cash that you get from the stock. That's this is probably I know I'm harp I'm harping on this uh, quite a bit, uh, but this is probably the number one mistake that I see is, is folks selling stock and then gifting the cash from the stock. Don't do that. Give the stock directly. So how much stock can you uh, uh, can you give and uh, get a uh, tax benefit from it? Um, so here, what we're talking about here, this is only applies for folks who itemize on their taxes. Uh, that is, you have deductions that go beyond the standard deduction and you can make deductions uh, beyond that. So if you find yourself itemizing, uh, this is for you. If you do, if you don't itemize and just do the standard deduction, um, then uh, you're not going to be able to get all the all, all the financial benefits here uh, because you're not going to be able to make the deduction. Um, but even if you don't itemize and you just make your standard deduction, when you gift uh, an appreciated stock, uh, the nice thing about that is you still don't realize the gains. If, if you don't itemize, you can't make the deduction, but at least you don't realize the gains. So that goes back to our number one rule, don't sell the stock and give away the cash. Gift the stock directly. Um, and when we talk about the mechanics of gifting the stock directly, um, uh, you can uh, reach out to the nonprofit and they can give you their uh, brokerage account information. I actually don't recommend doing that because it adds more labor for the nonprofit. I recommend giving it through a donor advice fund, which we're gonna talk about more in a bit. Um, the, the other thing in terms of how much you can deduct uh, with the stock is up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. Um, uh, now, and that's just with the, the uh, stock itself. Now, one thing to, to keep in mind is that technically you can gift more than that um, and you can roll it over to future years, but it's not nearly as effective. The reason it's not nearly as effective is because when you roll it over in the future years, um, it only it goes back and it looks at only the cost basis of the stock. Uh, so if you've given more than the cost basis of the stock in the previous years, then you may not be able to roll anything over. And even if you are able to roll anything over, if that amount has appreciated uh, quite a lot, you don't get to deduct any of that appreciation. Uh, so that's why that 30% threshold is important um, and why that kind of carryover effect isn't as appealing as it initially sounds. Um, the, the other thing is making sure that um, not only do you make sure you gift the stock directly, uh, but also that you hold the stock for longer than one year. Um, the reason that you hold it for longer than one year is that when you do that, then you can deduct um, the amount that you sell it for, which includes both the cost basis, which is the amount that you purchased it for originally, and all the appreciation. If you don't hold it say you hold a stock for six months and then you want to give and then you want to uh, give it to a charity your benefits are much less uh, so in that scenario you can only deduct the cost basis that is the amount that you purchased it for you don't get to deduct any of the appreciation that's why holding it longer than a year is so important um okay so i, I think those are the main topics here uh don't sell those stocks don't do it. Um, uh, uh, we'll get into purchasing with an, uh, another asset that doesn't apply as much with, uh, with stocks. Um, and then uh, hold that stock longer than a year, uh, particularly if it's appreciated. All right. And uh, like I said before, we'll, we'll get a, a fact pattern where we can start to apply some of this stuff too, because um, I find it's hard to think of some of these things in the abstract. Oh, and the other thing too is, um, I'll make these uh, slides available um, on the goodie bag part of my uh, personal website, aaronhammond.com, and I have some links on each of these two on um, the, uh, uh, the essays where they go into to more depth. So we haven't talked about cash uh, other than don't gift the cash uh, from uh, selling stock because you just want to gift the stock directly. Don't, don't give the stock uh, don't, don't, don't sell the, the stock. Uh, but say the only thing you have is cash um, and you uh, either don't wanna sell the stock that you have or you don't have stock um, or it hasn't aged uh, a year and you just wanna gift cash. Uh, well, if, uh, if that's the case, 
then you do have some uh, benefits available to you. So for example, um, this the little panel with everyone is so hard to move out of the way. Uh, um, so one of the one of the things is that again, just like with the stock, uh, being able to de deduct a cash gift is only applicable if you itemize. Uh, there are some um, exceptions for the year 2020 and 2021. 20, uh, uh, we can go over them at the at the end. Um, but as a uh, otherwise, um, uh, gifting cash is something that you can only deduct when you itemize. Um, if you've given any kind of stock and you also uh, gift cash, then the total cap uh, between them is 50% of your adjusted gross income. If you don't gift any kind of stock at all and you only gift cash, then the cap is 60%. And you can roll them over in future years. Uh, but if you roll it over with cash, it doesn't have the same kind of like negative issues as it does, does with stock because um, there's no appreciation with uh, cash. It only goes down in value. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's something to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, and then the, the main pitfall is um, you're giving cash. Uh, so you don't get to uh, deduct any kind of appreciation. Um, you really, really want to focus on assets that appreciate. Uh, that's really the, the way you're going to get the best kind of benefit uh, with uh, gifting. Um, cash is generally something that you want to avoid giving in terms of uh, tax benefits. Yeah. Um, oh, and one, one exception here, like for when you might want to give cash uh, would be if there is some kind of matching opportunity where uh, they require you to gift cash. Uh, so example, Facebook matching. Um, you can technically give a uh, stock through every.org, um, but if they have like a small window and you don't have a chance to set that up, um, then you might need to give uh, cash in the interim. Um, and that may still be worthwhile just because that matching is so nice um, as an effective way of giving. So that's a scenario where gifting cash might actually make sense. So giving tools, um, uh, here we're gonna talk about donor advised funds. A donor advised fund is basically a checking account that you use for charity when once you put uh, money into the checking account or, or stock or any other type of asset, um, you can't get it out for other personal reasons. You can only give it to charities. So you think about it as uh, a checking account that can only be used to gift to charities. And here you see the logo for Fidelity Charitable. Um, I've like interacted with a number of donor advised funds, a number of banks. Most major banks have a donor advised fund. Fidelity uh, is really the best one that there is. Um, every time I think about like another donor advised fund, uh, they turn out to be crappy for, for some reason or another. Uh, so far, Fidelity um, hasn't. Uh, been bad. They're also the largest donor advised fund in the world. So maybe they have, they, maybe there's a reason for why they, uh, why they got there. Um, so why a donor advised fund? Uh, from your perspective, um, and I think about this both from the donor's perspective and from the nonprofit's perspective. So being in both, on, on both ends, um, it consolidates uh, giving receipts to one location. So if you're gifting to like a whole bunch of different charities, then like maybe like you gotta check your email and you got like a special tax folder or something and that's kind of a pain. But if you gift through a donor advised fund, um, say through Fidelity, you just go log on through your bank account and you see all the places that you've uh, given to and all your tax receipts are all in one location. Uh, donor advised funds also make stock gifts really easy. Um, so you just uh, particularly, you, so for example, with Fidelity, um, if you have stock that's not in your Fidelity account, you can uh, port it over and it works. Uh, if you have uh, a brokerage account within Fidelity, it's even easier, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be within the same bank. Um, but um, using a donor advised fund is, is great for, for gifting stocks. Um, the other thing is that it makes your planning a lot easier too. So say 
you're thinking about your taxes and it's getting towards the end of the year, which it is getting towards the end of the year. And you're thinking like, you know, I'm kind of like between like a couple of charities or I don't quite know yet, but I know like for tax purposes, this is going to be an important year for me to donate because I really need to uh, reduce my, uh, my taxable income. And so what you can do is you can make your gift in that tax year. And once it hits your donor advice fund account, that's your gift for tax purposes. Um, and when you distribute that gift is not relevant for tax purposes. Um, that's just, you, you have complete flexibility uh, there. Um, and something else to keep in mind is that you can uh, technically um, invest within a donor advised fund. Um, so like normally you don't have a whole lot of options, basically index type in investing. You get a little bit more flexibility if you have a, a whole uh, ton of money in your donor advice fund, but for, for most folks that uh, you, you don't get a lot of investment uh, options. Now, one thing to keep in mind is some, I've had some people ask, um, should I go ahead and put everything in the donor advice fund and then like let it appreciate? Well, you can do that. Uh, the thing is all that appreciation that happens in the donor advice fund after you've given, like that's not beneficial for you at all for, for tax purposes. Uh, so it's best to let the appreciation occur before you put the money into the donor advice fund. Uh, that way you can maximize your deduction. Uh, so in terms of the nonprofit end, which is an end that I think about quite a lot. Uh, so there's this complicated thing that's invisible to most people um, outside of the nonprofit world. Uh, some people in the nonprofit world don't understand this very well. It's called the public support test. Uh, it's a complex calculation for where um, income comes from uh, for a nonprofit. Uh, if, uh, if that money is too concentrated from uh, private individuals or other non-public support type resources, like, like outside of like other public support charities, um, then um, it counts against what's called this public support test. If a nonprofit fails this public support test, it means that they aren't able to give some of the same kinds of tax advantages to their future donors, and they have a much more complicated paperwork that they have to fill out in the future. Uh, it basically makes it a kind of a real pain for them in the future. Now, if you give through a donor advice fund, particularly if you give a large amount, um, it all counts as public support for the charity in regard to this test. Uh, so say there's a charity that, particularly for a charity that's not, that doesn't have a whole lot of funds, say a charity has like a um, million dollars a year and you're gifting $10 million. Well, if you just write them a check or if you um, give them $10 million in stock and you don't use a donor advised fund, uh, then you could seriously jeopardize your public support, uh, support test. And this is not something that you wanna do. Um, and even for like mid-sized donations, uh, giving through a donor advice fund, not only will help them with the public support test, but it makes it a whole lot easier. Like as an example, like as the executive director of, of CES, when someone insists on giving stock, like what I have to do is I have to go through the two-factor author, author, authentication with uh, our, our, our bank, uh, set it up. I have to go through our policies, uh, sell the stock, track it and everything, um, uh, be able to communicate through the donor like what, um, uh, uh, when we got it, um, what, the, what the value was. It, it, it adds a lot of time on our end. And this is like multiple people, like we have to get an accountant, like has to get me, um, our, our director of philanthropy may, may be involved at the same time. Um, so this can add a lot of staff time. Don't, don't do this. Um, in contrast with that, when, uh, when we get a donation from a donor advice fund, even when someone uses a stock that they put into the donor advice fund, uh, what I get from Fidelity is uh, an, uh, uh, a bank transfer like directly into our bank account and, um, uh, and we just get a notification over email that we have funds in our bank account. Uh, we don't have to get a whole bunch of staff involved. It doesn't like, it is just so, so much easier. And also another um, shout out to Fidelity, uh, other banks will make it so that 
uh, we have to go and get a physical check. And like to for some folks, like it may not sound like a big deal, but like in in practice, like it does add a bit of time, like having to go through sign into the bank, um, and then like uh, go through and and um, even remote depositing a bunch of checks, depending on how the nonprofit is set up. Like for, uh, for CES, like I'm personally the one who has to do this. And you'd, you'd, you'd much rather me do other things with my time than go through and, and do this procedure. Um, so uh, uh, Fidelity doesn't do that. Whereas others like Charles Schwab, um, I have no idea why. We've talked to them. They refuse to make it easier. Um, but uh, Fidelity just does a, a bank transfer and notifies us via email. So much easier. Uh, again, just another kind of shout out to Fidelity for making everybody's lives, uh, lives easier. Um, so on donor advised funds is offered by uh, many major banks. Actually, again, recommend you don't go with any of the other ones. I recommend you just go with Fidelity, uh, even if your brokerage account is within a different bank. Um, the minimum deposits have recently been removed. Um, so Fidelity, um, you don't have a minimum deposit. You can just open up a, a donor advice fund. You don't even have to have any money. Just uh, open it up and uh, it's ready for you in, in the future. Another uh, horror story I heard about uh, from someone else is that from another bank, I think it was, uh, I think it was Vanguard maybe, um, uh, the person had given everything from their donor advice fund and the bank just closed their donor advice fund. Um, they didn't leave it open. And so like next time they have to make a gift, they have to reopen, like they have to open a new account. Uh, so nonsense, like I have no idea why these banks are making it so hard. Fidelity seems to be the only one getting it right. So, and Fidelity pays me nothing uh, to, uh, to say this. Uh, they've just done a really good job. Uh, they make my life easier. They make your life easier. Uh, just, just use Fidelity. Uh, and there are some small fees with Fidelity, but they're pretty trivial, uh, particularly if you use any kind of like the investment stuff, it'll pay the, the, the fees. Um, so uh, those are trivial. I wouldn't worry about the fees. Um, and then, uh, let's see, okay. yeah. All right, so that's about uh, donor advice funds. Use donor advice funds, they're wonderful. Uh, don't, don't make things hard on yourself. Don't make things harder than the nonprofit. So the other thing uh, we'll talk about just briefly is planned giving. Uh, so planned giving um, is way easier than most people think. Um, so a lot of times when people think of planned giving, they think, oh, well, I've got to write out my will. I've got to get some people to watch me sign a document. I've got to get some person with a stamp uh, to also watch me sign this document. I have to pay an attorney. It's like, ah. Oh, such a pain. It's way easier than that. And in fact, I would say that that route, not only is it more laborious, it's also uh, not as efficient with uh, giving as well. What, what uh, I recommend normally with, uh, with giving is thinking about your financial account. So here, talking about your brokerage account, talking about your savings account, talking about your retirement accounts, all those accounts, when you go into your uh, log in on your bank online, you can set a beneficiary for all of those. Um, and when you set a beneficiary, that can include a charitable beneficiary. Now, one thing uh, there is that you can have it go directly to a charity itself. Um, another way to do it that's a little bit more sophisticated is to have your beneficiary be your donor advised fund. Uh, so within a donor advised fund, you can set a beneficiary like within the donor advised fund. So like when you, when you die, that the funds from the donor advised fund go to the charity of your choosing. Now, um, when you set the beneficiary for other accounts as your donor advised fund, what you do is you simplify the process because like over time, like our, like the dynamics of uh, what's a good place to give to or, or, or what's not, or your own personal preferences can change over time. And so you don't want to have to go through and change the beneficiary for every individual account um, because it's pretty laborious. Uh, but if you make your uh, donor advice fund the beneficiary, then you only have to change the beneficiary in one place and makes it a bit easier. Um, some places like aren't as big about having a donor advice fund as a beneficiary. So you may need to check uh, with them first. 
Um, uh, others, fortunately, are. It shouldn't make a difference from their perspective. I find that they're just being annoying when they don't do it. Um, with uh, And of course, if you do Fidelity, uh, if you have your accounts in Fidelity, um, then of course, it, it's, it's way easier uh, then. Um, but uh, other places should also allow you to do that. Um, one thing too is, uh, uh, so for example, um, if you have life insurance through your work, um, right now I think it's uh, not taxable up to $50,000 with life insurance through your work. You can also make a charity or your donor advice fund the beneficiary for life insurance through your work. I personally do that as well. Um, uh, so that's another way to, um, to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, this is uh, uh, setting a beneficiary is super easy to do. You're just going into your account settings. The other nice thing about setting a beneficiary within your accounts, technically these are called payable on death accounts, but it's just like your regular account, but you're just setting a beneficiary, is that you don't have to go through probate. Uh, when you go through probate court, um, say, which is normal through a will, it can take quite a long time. You have creditors to deal with. Uh, you have all kinds of obstacles there. You sidestep all of that when you set a beneficiary within your financial account. It's just way easier. Um, so uh, set beneficiaries for all your financial accounts. Um, you can, uh, of course, like also, uh, if you have uh, other dependents or, or loved ones that uh, rely on your financial resources, you can set more than one beneficiary. Um, so you can keep that in mind. And uh, um, I would also uh, recommend um, using your dinner advice fund as a bit of sherry for, for simplicity. Okay, cool. Now we have a uh, uh, problem set. So here we're gonna talk about uh, Tammy. Uh, we're gonna say Tammy um, is really big into tech. Uh, maybe she bought uh, uh, Tesla stock or uh, Apple or something. Went way up. Good for Tammy. She made a great investment. Um, and so that uh, we'll say she uh, bought a thousand dollars worth of stock. Again, we call that our cost basis. Um, and the stock goes up a ton. It's now worth a hundred thousand uh, dollars. So uh, we'll say Tammy donates all hundred thousand dollars to the Center for Election Science. And Tammy's adjusted gross income would otherwise be $150,000. So she sold all her stock. She's got all this cash now and she just gives it to, to CES. Um, now, what has Tammy done wrong? And what has Tammy done right here? And what should she have done instead? This is an open question to you. Tammy, she bought $1,000 worth of stock a bunch of years ago, now worth a whole bunch of money. She sold, all, excuse me, she, she sold all that um, and she just gave it away in cash. What did she do right here? What did she do wrong? So, 100xing her investment seems like a, a right thing. Well, yeah, yeah she sure that. did that right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then the first thing that you, you you've been hammering on, like you know, don't don't sell and give cash, just just donate the stock. So that's that's obviously the place to start. But she did wrong. Right. I think. Also, it seems sounds like from what you're saying, with 150k, she could only like reduce 30% by donating stock, right? Or claim deduct 30% if she donates the stock. So she should probably whatever 30% of 150k is what that's mm -hmm. five. Yeah, whatever that is. Yeah, 50. Yeah, 50k ish, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's what she should give, and then she could give those over two years, I guess. That is that like. Mm -hmm. the recommended thing like give 50k this year that's you know the amount or whatever or 30k or whatever it is this year and then the next year do the same yes assuming she... so i think you got two big ones there's maybe one more one more um anyone else want to so uh adam mentioned uh poor tammy she she sold the stock she did the number one cardinal sin she sold the stock and then also uh, she uh, is relying on a carryover, which we know is not nearly as good because she's gonna hit that 30% threshold. Uh, actually um, here, uh, she, um, she, 
she's going to realize the the gain of hundred thousand dollars. Her adjusted gross income is going to be two fifty, but it's going to be in cash. So she's not going to hit the threshold because um, she's giving in cash. Um, so right. So if she corrected the first issue, yeah. then then her her AGI would still be one hundred fifty, right? Correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so then you're going to talk like, like, let's assume she corrects the first issue. Then the next like mistake to correct is not to give it all away, but to like figure out what's 30% of her AGI Correct. and give that yeah. much away today. That, yeah. That's, that's what. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And now she, if she gives it in, in cash, she, she, uh, uh, she doesn't have, uh, uh, well, she goes a little bit over, but she can carry it over. Uh, but if she does it correctly and just gifts the stock directly, then she, Thinks about the threshold. There's there's one other thing here. There's the um, there's the thirty percent threshold uh, when she uh, gifts correctly um, by gifting the stock directly. Um, there's a threshold gifting the stock directly. There's one more thing. There's you, a third you thing here. Give to a donor advised fund instead of giving it directly. That's right. Yeah. Like why why force uh, someone to uh, go ahead and uh, get uh, 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 paper and ink involved and having to get other people involved, wasting staff time. Yeah, use a donor advice fund. Yeah. Having, having like donated stock without a donor advice fund directly, it is like a pain in the ass. And why would you want to even do that to yourself, let alone like the charity that you're giving to? I totally agree, Adam. It's terrible. Don't get people to stop doing it. Get them to open donor advice fund accounts. So particularly through Fidelity. All right. So I think we got a lot of this. Um, so, um, so she sold the asset instead of gifting it. Tammy, what were you thinking? Uh, we'll do better next time, Tammy. Um, and then she didn't use a, a DAF. And then the other component is the 30% uh, uh, threshold. And what she uh, should have done uh, instead uh, is she should have uh, gifted the 30% uh, in stock uh, through a DAF. And uh, she should have also maybe checked for employer matching too. That would have been another uh, appropriate step. Um, and uh, and thinking about and giving it directly, using a DAF, the uh, 30% threshold. Then there's like one other thing, which I actually did not mention uh, earlier. Um, and that is she has some flexibility here. Um, with uh, her her giving with the, the stock. And so say she really wants to, um, she doesn't want the, uh, say she wants to just get this all out of the way and, and done. Um, and she actually intends on giving another 30% with some other income um, or some other stock uh, in, the, in the next year. And she's going to run into the same 30% thing issue in the future. If she finds that she's, going to consistently go above that 30%. Another tactic that she can use is she can give to a uh, 501c4 uh, charity. Uh, so there are a number of charities out there that do a bit more lobbying that are great causes. And when you gift to a 501c4, you not you're, are, you aren't able to make a deduction uh, when you give to a, a 501c4. But if you're already in a situation where you max out the amount that you can deduct, that's no longer an issue. Now what you care about is not realizing your gains. So if you gift stock directly to a uh, 501c4, unfortunately in this case, like you do actually have to do that kind of pain in the ass transfer uh, through, your, through your bank because you can't do it through a donor advised fund anymore when you gift it to a 501c4. But you can give the, the stock directly to a 501c4 and not realize the uh, the gains. So she still she can still get the benefit there of of donating the excess to the five hundred one c four and not realizing the gains. Of course, she doesn't get the deduction, but she wasn't going to get that anyway. Um, so that's another kind of like technical note if you're thinking about five hundred one c four charities as something uh, else as a, a potential beneficiary for charity. Right. So that's Tammy. Now we're gonna talk about crypto giving. Okay. And we'll have another uh, fact pattern and scenario there. So uh, again, uh, just kind of like harping this, uh, uh, just pushing this really uh, deep. Uh, and that is 
don't realize gains. Just don't do it. Um, and so, um, uh, say you have uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or some other uh, random, uh, random uh, uh, cryptocurrency. Um, do not sell the cryptocurrency. Like you realize all the gains that way. And also, do not purchase another cryptocurrency with the currency that's appreciated. You will also realize the gains that way. When you purchase an asset with another asset, the original asset uh, realizes all of the gains. So don't do that. Like, and that, that's something that is a bit more particular to cryptocurrency. So, um, yeah. So things that don't trigger a, a taxable event when you give to a 501c3 uh, and when you give to a 501c4. Um, just don't don't sell it. Don't sell it. Just gift it directly. And of course, use a donor advice fund. Um, or some other mechanisms that we're going to talk about later. So uh, what to uh, uh, be aware of, um, you want to gift the appreciated uh, crypto directly. That same thing in terms of holding it longer than a year, that applies here as well. That applies to all uh, assets. You want to hold it for longer than a year. Um, again, here, only deductible if you itemize. Um, there's that rollover 30% rule that applies to all appreciated assets. Uh, pitfalls to avoid. Um, just going to keep saying it. Don't sell and then donate. That's the number one mistake I see. Um, and uh, something with, that's uh, particularly for, for crypto, another mistake I've seen, don't use crypto to purchase another cryptocurrency uh, if you can avoid it, uh, because that is a uh, realizing event. Um, so that's a taxable event. You realize all the gains. Um, and then the same thing about the uh, the one year. If you hold it for less than a year, you don't get to um, deduct the appreciation. All right. Um, something else that's particular to cryptocurrency is um, you have, say you've bought Bitcoin or Ethereum at a whole bunch of different times. Um, maybe you bought it from the same exchange. Maybe uh, you bought it, you got it, you acquired it in a different way. Um, if you're storing all this in the same place, um, say like you've got like a bunch of dollar bills and um, you put it in your wallet and um, you want to give someone like a particular dollar bill or something like that, like it's all kind of shuffled around. You don't know which is which. Well, when, when we're thinking about cryptocurrency, like it's kind of the same idea uh, going on. And so uh, we realize that if, uh, I mean, cryptocurrency is very volatile, it goes up and down all the time. And so it can be really important sometimes to pick the exact set of coins uh, that you want. And if they're all mixed up in the same exchange or in the same wallet, then uh, that gets really complicated. And if you haven't kept your records, uh, it's gonna use a principle of called first in, first out. Um, that may be fine, like it, it may actually work out fine for you in your situation, but there may be instances where you really want to specify uh, which uh, set of coins you're talking about. And to be able to do that, um, you need to um, record these four pieces of information, and that is the date and time each unit was acquired. Um, I would recommend um, um, going down to the second on, on this as well. Um, just because it's so volatile, um, your uh, uh, cost basis and the fair market value of unit at each time it was acquired. Um, when you're selling it, you want the exact time again down to the second um, and the uh, fair market value of each unit when it's sold uh, or transferred or, or, or whatever. Uh, and if you don't do that, it's going to... Uh, your accounting is going to assume uh, first in, first out principles for uh, for that. Uh, so this is again a little bit more specific to cryptocurrency. Make sure you have really good record keeping. And some exchanges are getting a bit better about doing some of this automatically for you. Um, but uh, personally, like I have a spreadsheet on uh, for my crypto accounts where I record the exact second and all this other information too on a spreadsheet, just to be case, uh, just to be just to be sure in case. Um, and uh, again, like looking at the, uh, say you're looking at that 30% and you're going to go over that 30%, uh, 
um, particularly if you're dealing with an asset that's appreciated quite a lot that uh, uh, that's kind of like out of proportion with your typical uh, adjusted gross income, um, you can uh, uh, gift 30% one year, you can gift 30% of your adjusted gross, gross income the other year, um, and you keep doing that. Again, like we do that carryover thing, and we uh, are no longer able to deduct all that uh, real, all, all the appreciated gains. We can only deduct the cost basis uh, if we try to carry it over. So we've got to make each gift separately if we want to try to uh, keep ourselves in line with that 30%. But say um, we want to expedite our giving and that 30% is going to be a barrier. You can do a couple of things. One is you can just say like, you know what? Um, uh, I think this charity is really important. I'm just going to go ahead and give to them uh, anyway and uh, not get the same kind of deduction. Still, you're getting the, the tax benefit of not realizing the gain. Uh, that's still a really big benefit, um, but you don't get the, the deduction. And there's technically that carryover, but it's not, um, not, very, uh, not very appealing. Um, so uh, again, what you can do just like you can with uh, stock, with cryptocurrency, you can give to a C4 organization because uh, once you get over that 30%, because again, you're not getting the deduction anyway, your big tax advantage now is avoid realizing the gains. Um, so you can do that when giving to a 501c4. Now keep in mind this, this uh, uh, approach may not work with other types of organizations, say 527 organizations. Um, uh, the law actually appears less clear on this. I, I did try to look a little bit more deeply uh, into this to, uh, to get a clearer answer, uh, but I've seen some places look at it and say that, um, uh, gifting to a 527 is a taxable event. Um, so I would um, uh, stick with uh, 501c4s unless you um, uh, get really good information to the, to the contrary. Right. Um, so what kind of mechanism do you use to give uh, when, using a, uh, when using cryptocurrency? So there are a bunch of exchanges out there. I know there's also a, a new uh, um, effective uh, altruism uh, um, uh, uh, organization that is helping with uh, uh, gifting with uh, a subset of some uh, EA organizations. Um, these are some other ones. Uh, if you can, uh, just use a, uh, something like uh, donor advice fund through Fidelity Charitable. That's super convenient. Uh, their fees are really low, uh, makes it pretty uh, pretty simple. Um, they they do give you some paperwork to do, so that's something to keep in mind. It's not quite as easy as uh, gifting stock, um, so they make it kind of a pain. Uh, and then, if you want to give to a C four, um, you can use uh, in given. Uh, they do have and and here. I, so like before when, when I was talking and saying like, hey, like, you know, it's kind of like a pain when you gift stock and like, it's kind of complicated. Um, we'll multiply that by a factor of 10. And like, now that's with cryptocurrency. Don't, don't do that to your favorite nonprofit. Don't make them uh, be an expert in, uh, in cryptocurrency. Make it as easy as possible for them. That's why you're using these uh, intermediaries because if you give it to them directly, um, like uh, they may make a mistake uh, because they're not used to doing this. Like they may lose the entire gift potentially. Uh, there are lots of things that could that can go wrong uh, with uh, um, with crypto transfers um, when you're dealing with someone who doesn't um, uh, work in this uh, space regularly. So uh, even when you give um, to a uh, uh, C4, I would also recommend using that intermediary if you can. Uh, so InGiven is a platform that you can give to a C4. Um, it's not a donor advised fund. Um, so um, something to keep in mind. Um, and, and also the um, when you see this column that says large gifts okay, uh, that, that's answering the question of whether uh, they're gonna be able to work well with that public support test that we mentioned earlier. Um, so the ones that say yes, uh, you can give very large gifts like 
um, six figure, seven figure gifts, and that's not going to be an issue for the non uh, for the nonprofit. Um, something else to keep in mind is that every.org looks really appealing now. So um, at first, uh, in terms of coin versatility, um, they seemed a little bit more limited. Uh, but now when you, I wish they were a little bit more prominent about this because it's such a nice feature. When you go and dig into their FAQs within their site and uh, you indicate that you are interested in giving more than $5,000 with a cryptocurrency, but it's say it's not like one of the, the main ones. If you reach out to them and say like, hey, like I wanna give a six or seven figure gift, uh, but it's with this more obscure cryptocurrency, um, they are much more willing uh, to, to work with you there. And half a percent for the fees is really low uh, for, for this and for them to be able to handle that. So every.org is looking really good in that, in that respect. All right, so now we have an application problem. So we get to talk about all this. So we have uh, Carrie. So Carrie uh, has bought a bunch of different crypto before, uh, including Bit, uh, Bitcoin. She doesn't keep real close uh, track of it. Um, and uh, uh, she bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoin back when it was at $250 sometime in 2015. It's uh, increased uh, 200 times that. So uh, now it's worth uh, $200,000. And uh, Carrie, she's just so excited and she just sells all of that Bitcoin. And she just got a, 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 a a uh, checking account just full of cash uh, now as, as a result. So what Carrie does, gets all excited. She gets out her checkbook and she writes a, a check to CES for $200,000. Uh, and uh, keeping in mind here that Carrie's, we said that Carrie's adjusted gross income would otherwise be $335,000 uh, without the sale. Uh, she works in the tech sector and she does a she's like super killer at her job. Uh, they pay her a whole bunch of money. Uh, so what has Carrie done wrong here? What has she done right? And what should Carrie have done instead? So open it up to the floor. That sounds like she didn't keep good records for one thing, like you said, right? I know, I know. She's going to have to use, uh, what's she going to have to use as a result of using poor records? Uh, FIFO, right? Yep, first in, first out. That's right. Could she use the blockchain as the record and figure that out if she wanted to post ex post? Like um, before trading, but obviously if she hadn't recorded it, she might be able to like look it up actually on the blockchain. Like that seems like the benefit of the public ledger, right? You don't actually have to keep track. The ledger keeps track for you. It, as long as she's able to verify it somehow, uh, she can she can do that. Um, but I mean, if uh, it's uh, it's more challenging than than having done it previously, unless she really knows what she's doing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Um, uh, well, if we we'll, we'll say Carrie is like maybe just like kind of like an average cryptocurrency person, she doesn't know how to do that. She she spent all her uh, hours getting really good at uh, at programming and and. Yeah. yeah, I think someone else should, should should be answering these questions. I've I've been answering. I was just gonna. She also sold instead of like donating through an intermediary, so she realized the gains when she didn't have to. Right. That's right. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, she got her checkbook out. Um, and the other thing to, to note with the uh, intermediaries here is that uh, Fidelity and every.org, um, as well as uh, an endowment, uh, those are charities within themselves. And so the same thing applies as when we're talking about uh, donor advised funds. So when you gift to a charity, uh, that's when the tax event uh, happens. Uh, so uh, that that is, uh, she gets a deduction right then when it goes through that intermediary. All right, so she, 
she sold everything. She's got everything in her checking account. Um, she didn't use an intermediary. Um, and then didn't get the asset directly rather than cash, which is a mistake. Yeah. You know, the realizing the gains. Right, right. And then there's uh one one more. So say um so we'll go to that one. Um yeah, so this is this are the, the big three. Now what could she have done instead? So these were the, if, if Carrie was looking at this uh, uh, with more informed eyes, like what, what would she have done instead? I mean, wouldn't she go after the, uh, those five charitable organizations that you provided, Fidelity, mm -hmm. the end amount, and not cash out and not swap currency for currency, but go through those charitable um, 401c3, c4, right? Yeah, so the, the charities themselves, the intermediaries are c3s. Um, uh, so uh, that would be the appropriate way, uh, particularly if she's doing something in very common currency, such as Bitcoin, um, say she's using like Dogecoin or something like that. Um, she probably has to go through every.org. And now every.org uh, on their website, I believe they don't accept Dogecoin like right off the bat. But if she says like, hey, like I'm making a six figure gift, um, that's gonna be enough to be able to have a conversation with them to say uh, where she's probably gonna get the allowance to be able to, uh, to donate that asset uh, through them. Now, the other thing is um, she hits that 30% threshold. So, what, what is she going to do about that? Uh, she has a, a long-term appreciated asset that uh, uh, is greater than 30% of her adjusted gross income. How does she deal with that? She, she definitely split it up over more years to get more deductions, but like also probably part of it should be about like which ones she's going to deduct this year based on how much they've appreciated versus you, you want to be strategic. I'm not quite sure how, how the strategy maps out there, but it probably makes, it's probably important which, which particular coins because they're not totally fungible. Mm -hmm. uh, she is donating because they, they will have appreciated different amounts. Yeah, if there's a certain uh, coin that's maybe more volatile for uh, than another, like uh, that's, that's one aspect that you can uh, use in terms of of uh, uh, picking coins um, to, to donate. Uh, and then the, the other component is, if it's about that 30%, um, obviously she can technically carry it over to multiple years, but we know that if she does that, then she only gets to deduct the cost basis, um, which may uh, not be carried over if the cost basis doesn't exceed the 30% of the adjustable, adjustable gross income of the, of the, of the first year. Uh, so splitting it up is an approach. And then also if she's in a situation where she's just thinking like, you know what, like I can do this in future years too. And I'm going to hit that same kind of 30% issue. What she can do then is she can just say like, you know what, uh, I'll go to the C3 anyway. And uh, because I can't get anything above the, uh, um, well, let me see here. Um, so she go to a C4. That's, that's, that's the, uh, because she's not going to be able to get the deduction anyway. Um, and she avoids realizing what the gains by uh, uh, giving to the, to the C4. Uh, what, one other thing I was thinking about just in the, in the moment is that, um, well, yeah, I guess another strategy doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so this is the main ones. Just, just to be clear because I, I think I to see if I understand what you're yeah, saying yeah. like there's no particular tax advantage to giving to a c4 once you've realized your deductions it's just that the disadvantage versus a c3 is is gone at that point and so mm -hmm. if you really prefer a c4 over a c3 that is the time to do it that's what I think you're saying is that correct that's right yeah yeah because okay. uh, you still get a tax advantage giving to a c4 and that tax advantage is that you don't realize the realize gains. You just don't get a deduction, but you don't realize the gains. So, so, so I, I had kind of a question on that too. Um, sorry, um, 
that if so once you hit the 30 percent so say if i if i give 30 percent in appreciated assets to my DAF, if i then give more appreciated assets to my DAF, that that also should not be realizing gains right i just don't get it deducted that's right yes so like basically once you get above 30 percent um you know like you said if you have significant appreciation over your cost basis you you don't want to be cashing that out um but at that point it's basically like whatever you give it to it's all the same um but but in either case it is important to not uh realize the cap gains there that, that's right although i would maybe give a little nuance there that um uh you may realize gains if you give to say like a 527 organization um okay. but with when you give to a c3 or c4 you're not realizing those gains. I had a quick question. Um, if you had $100,000 that you started with and then it 5 x is there a way to take, um, pull out the 100,000 that uh, the original investment, let the um, unrealized gains ride and then donate your original investment without any tax implications? Uh, no, and, is it and the possible to do the, that? The reason for that is because you have uh, the the cost basis and the appreciation are intertwined within each individual unit, so you can't separate them. So, uh, say like you have like a, a stock, like ten stocks of, of Tesla, um, and um, it's gone up, so that like your uh, uh, cost basis is roughly. 10% of the total amount. You can't just like um, refer to one stock as your cost basis. They're all intertwined. So within each individual stock, 10% of that stock's value is the cost basis and then that other, um, that, that remainder is the appreciation. So they're intertwined within each, within each other. But in that example, you could just gift 10% of your stock and it, it sounds like that would be basically equivalent to, to what was suggested, right? Um, you, you can't gift just your realization and you can't gift just your cost basis. You can't right. But it's like say, say that you bought some, say you bought hundred K and then it went up 10 X. Then what you can do is not cash out any of it, but just, you can just donate 10% of it and you won't, you won't incur any cap gains tax and you will give to the charity. Right. Um, so like if you were going to withdraw money and then donate it, I mean, this would be, you, you could give 10% of your position to the charity without get, realizing any tax. Uh, yeah. I mean, if anytime you gift, um, uh, an asset, including an, uh, an appreciated asset, when you, uh, gift that to a charity, um, you're not realizing any of the gains. Uh, so I think those are all those. And um, now uh, to the end, so just for questions, um, and I've got kind of like some quick uh, takeaways. Um, one, where you give matters most. Um, don't sell and then give, just don't do it. Don't let other people do it. Um, and you give directly to the org or the donor advice fund. And you should almost always use a donor advised fund, um, preferably Fidelity. Um, and uh, when you're gifting appreciated, uh, appreciated assets, make sure they're held for longer than a year. That way you can deduct the appreciation and not just the, the cost basis. Keep good records for uh, your crypto. It will just make things easier for you. Um, uh, be mindful of that 30% threshold. Uh, you can break it up over multiple years. We also talked about different strategies uh, when it goes over, uh, such as like uh, gifting the carry, like the, the spillover to say a 501c4. Um, and um, consider the type of uh, crypto where you're giving. Uh, and we have some uh, different channels for, for doing that. You really strongly recommend you use an intermediary because uh, when you gift crypto to a nonprofit and they're less savvy, uh, you could just lose everything. Um, and so uh, using an intermediary is gonna be uh, uh, quite a bit uh, 
easier, uh, even if you have to pay some uh, small fee. Um, and I have uh, a ridiculous number of, of essays on uh, technical aspects of giving on my personal website. Um, so you can always use that as a reference. And the, the essays themselves are littered with uh, links. Um, so you can find original sources to everything. And I also recommend using this as uh, something that helps you have a conversation with your personal financial planner. Um, not all of them are really savvy on this, unfortunately. And so this can kind of make that conversation a lot easier. And then, of course, you can always uh, use these tactics to give to CES, preferably through a donor advisement. Cool. Any questions? Uh, I, have, I have a quick question about the DAF fees. Uh, so you mentioned like 0.6% non-fidelity and I, I don't quite remember how this works, but is it is it 0.6% when you put uh, assets in or when you take them out or is it just like first of the year they just charge you 0.6% or do you know how that works? Um, I, I don't think I have a, a confident answer. Uh, so I, uh, but regardless of over the balance of the full year or something like that, at least with Schwab, I think it used to be that way, but I, I don't know for sure. hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. That could be interesting. Cause if it's, if it's like 0.6% annualized, I guess then you're incentivized to donate sooner. And I, I guess like part of what I was afraid of was maybe it's, you know, like there's a one day a year where your fee kicks in. Right. And then if, if you give before that, you could potentially save on fees. Um, but I'll try to look into that. Yeah, I mean, personally, I haven't. Uh, so I obviously I use Fidelity Charitable for my individual giving. Um, I haven't really noticed uh, fees come into play uh, for me. Um, I allocate how they're invested through their different index options, but also um, I uh, uh, anytime I put money in my donor advice fund, it leaves it pretty quickly. Uh, so I. Uh, it, it may be that it's not in there long enough to um, experience some of the fees that uh, they indicate. Um, and then the other thing too, like they, uh, I think one component is like, um, it's like either that or hundred dollars, whatever is lower, I think maybe their, their fee now. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't ever been hit with that. Um, but uh, I, again, I think it's just because I don't leave uh, funds in there that long. Aaron, I had a question in the chat, um, kind of uh, uh, crypto specific. Um, if you're exchanging crypto for crypto, um, this is like a no-no. Is it still the case if you're doing it between like de derived currencies on the same chain? Like say you're swapping two ERC-20 coins or something like that, do you know? Um, I would suspect that it has similar effects, um, but uh... I, I can't say for certain. One, one question yeah, I thanks have. for organizing this. I had a quick question about um, uh, about kind of giving to every.org and just going to H and R Block next year and hoping they understand um, with that uh, you know what those hundred dollar um, uh, Bitcoin donations mean. Have, have you given in past years? Um, and is it relatively straightforward? To, for people to understand that, you know, so long as you have like the every.org receipt, that it's not a um, purchase that you've made, but that it's a, which, which you should be taxed on, but that it's a um, charitable gift, even if you're not going to deduct, uh, even if you're not going to be on the standard deduction, that's a charitable gift that you shouldn't be taxed on. Um, so is a question that uh, when you put money into your every.org account, whether um, you can evidence that that's a gift, is that the question? Exactly. Basically, if you give, you know, $100 um, to a charity through every.org and then you have the every.org receipt at the end of the year, is that like sufficient evidence to when you file your taxes that, yeah. um, oh, it's yeah. not that you are doing some shady um, yeah. uh, and, get crypto transaction that you should then be taxed on because the value had a, a, had increased since you purchased the coin. Yeah. And, and one thing, again, to uh, to remind on, uh, every.org is itself a charity. Um, so the tax, like the tax implications of the deduction occurred when you, once you put money mm -hmm. into the every.org account. 
Um, so just like a just like a death, like a lot of the principles apply there. Um, when you uh, distribute the funds, is independent of the uh, taxable event of uh, of um, when you uh, made the gift. So when you uh, put money into your every dot org account, or when you transfer it, or, or using crypto or, or whatever, uh, that's the uh, um, gift itself. Uh, that's that's for tax purposes. That's the gift. Now, when you distribute it after the fact, um, whenever that occurs, um, that's independent of uh, for for tax purposes. Um, so, just like for the donor advised fund for Fidelity, say you put stock or crypto in there. When you when you do that, like for tax purposes, that's your gift for the year. Whenever you did that, that timing, uh, that's what's important. When you distribute it out of that account. You, you can do that whatever. In fact, there's some controversy about uh, donor advised funds for some people who are um, uh, just kind of like leave it in there for a long time and don't do anything with it. Um, there's some controversy about folks who, uh, who, who do that, but they've already gotten the tax benefit. Um, but they can, right now there are no laws in the books that say you have to distribute um, money from your donor advice fund within a specified period of time. There's some, um, there's been a lot of talk about making it so that there's a limit so that you do have to give a certain percentage um, within a particular time frame within your donor advice fund. But right now there is no, uh, there's no time frame limit. Great, thank you. One quick question I had was regarding um, like selling stock. Uh, I just wanted to double check that, you know, I think there is like one case when it might be okay. And, you know, for me as someone who works in tech, the bulk of my compensation is in equities and like, basically I receive restricted stock units. And whenever I get a like disbursement of those, the, my employer like sells off a portion to pay for taxes. And as I understand it, the amount I receive, if I sell them right away before they've appreciated, it's, there's basically no additional tax on those. And so that's what I tend to do because I'm not, you know, comfortable holding like that much money in a single stock. And it seems like that's like one case when it might be okay to sell instead of donate directly. Maybe. For, for that, I think a lot of it's going to depend on what the cost basis is of the mm -hmm. stock when you acquire it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to uh, maybe uh, vary a bit. And for, for types of like, restricted stock, like that's going to be a little bit more uh, challenging versus stock that um, anyone can can purchase on on the exchange. Um, so like fortunately, other places like Fidelity Charitable, um, they can handle more complicated assets like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I would be hesitant to say anything personally about um, uh, being able to uh, sell the stock and then um, and then um, gift the the proceeds. Like uh, it, it, it intuitively it it feels to me like it violates that that rule, and I don't have like a clear way out in my head of getting around that violation. Um, and I'm just like worried about um, the difference between the cost basis and the uh, fair market uh, value. Now, now one thing to keep in mind too is that uh, sometimes the you may have some extra paperwork to do with more complicated forms of assets where you sure. have to get someone to um, assess the value of the asset that you're gifting. Um, so that, uh, that may be something that some folks experience. Um, you'll uh, surely experience that with uh, cryptocurrency. Well, I got to run, but thanks for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, one question: When you're, um, if you're giving stocks, and you don't always have to do this beforehand, but it, is it generally better to like, buy a diverse portfolio of individual stocks versus an index fund? Because if like one individual stock appreciates a bunch, um, like if you bought all the 500 individual stocks that make up the S&P 500 and you know one of them goes up obviously the most um, could you would there be tax benefits to doing an approach where then you just 
donate the most appreciated stock and get a like proportionally higher amount of tax benefit from that. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a bit more sophisticated. It's also the same approach that I personally do. Um, I, I I wouldn't uh, um, like there there are pros and cons of, of this. Like one is um, you have more risk because you're you're not uh, diversifying in the same way that you can with an index fund. So there's obviously more risk there. Um, uh, but you do get a um, utilize like some of the volatility there as well. So if you have an outlier stock that has appreciated uh, quite a lot, um, appreciated assets is really the name of the game in terms of really being able to maximize these deductions. Uh, so it does give you the ability to um, you have the potential to uh, um, utilize more uh, appreciated stocks um, because you're uh, by purchasing stocks individually, um, you're really asking for that volatility. So, to... um, and then the other related question, like if you use something like a donor advised fund, like um, I guess if if you transfer stocks into that, does it? Um, like if you have something like an index fund, presumably the oldest stock, like the first stock you purchase in the index mm -hmm. fund is appreciated the most. Do, do they make it fairly, or I, I take it for the most appreciation you'd want to sell the portion of your index fund that has, or like the funds that you put into that that appreciated the most, do they make that like fairly easy to do that? Or is that well, kind of Fidel complicated? I'll, I'll say that Fidelity does. Okay. <laughs> Uh, they, you, you may experience uh, 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 different levels of, of how easy it is with other with other banks, but uh, I think Fidelity does a good job. They they even have a tool that lets that where it's uh, it automatically identifies the most tax efficient stocks to give. Uh, so they just uh, they're a bunch of overachievers over there. Yeah, they also have insanely cheap indexes too. Yeah, this this talk was brought to you by Fidelity. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> but, but not sponsored. <laughs> well, uh, if there are no more questions, I can go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>